What's up, man? This is Immortal Technique, Harlem, New York. I'm here in LA. And you can check me out on the Bootleg Cab Podcast. You already know what it is, baby. Peace. All right, man. Bootleg Cab Podcast. We got a special guest in here. A legend. <laughs> Immortal Technique is here. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me on the show. Of course, man. I first discovered your music. I want to say I was probably like 14 or 15. Mm-hmm. Um, it might have been the first revolutionary, but I remember then I got to see you live in Phoenix. It might have been the revolutionary volume two tour. Mm-hmm. Who'd you have on tour with you um, around that time? Probably Poison Pen, maybe Chino XL. Mm-hmm. A few other cats. Yeah, so I got to see you live, and I saw I've seen. I mean, I've seen you live a bunch of times uh, over the years. Um, but yeah, man, you're an independent. I would say like a goat. In the independent hip hop space, man. Thank you. There's not a lot of people who could be like, yeah, I headlined festivals as an independent rapper. And I remember seeing you headline Rock the Bells. These are Rock the Bells pay dues, one yeah, of those. Yeah. I mean, I hold the record for some festivals for UTA from our old agency at United Talent. Uh, we did four festivals, sorry, three festivals in three different European countries, which were nowhere near each other within a 24 hour period. Wow. I used to do probably about. 200 250 shows a year now obviously it's a lot less because i have other responsibilities right. but unlike other artists who you know no disrespect to the dj of course focused a lot on mixtapes right i focused a lot on touring rather than mixtapes so i may only have like one or two free mixtapes but at the same time i have like 17 world tours under my belt I mean, right countries that people are like, oh my God, you've been to Australia, Tasmania, right. New Zealand, all these places, Romania, right? You Czech Republic, South America, all over the place, Morocco, Africa. I mean, yeah. I've touched now you're worldwide, dude. I mean, your music, I feel like your music was very like, you know, I feel like I learned so much from your music as a kid because it was before I really had like readily like internet access, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So like some of the shit like about like our government or just the world, like I first heard like you rapping about it. <laughs> Do you hear that a lot? I mean, I think it was during a time in which people were um, living in a post 9-11 world that was really fresh. Mm-hmm. And a lot of individuals were scared. They were looking for easy answers, looking for ways to blame people. And when I brought up things like, for example, that... Uh, I po- made a post today because it's the 20-year anniversary of Senator Wellstone's uh, death in mm-hmm. a mysterious plane crash. And he was one of the only senators after 9-11 that brought up the fact that bin Laden was a CIA asset. That was not something people wanted to discuss in 2002. Right. Right, that his code name, and this is not a conspiracy theory, No, it's not a conspiracy. It's true. Yeah. His code name was Timothy Osman, and that he carried out several um, acts and atrocities Um, in the name of the United States government for their purposes. But not just that. Also, talking to people in Afghanistan when I went there, Mm -hmm. he was responsible and took part in what they call the Hazara genocide, which is something that is going on now with the Taliban. And that's a series of Asiatic, um, Central Asian um, people from Afghanistan. And they were targeted for genocide. So before bin Laden ever killed any Americans, he murdered children outside of a city called Mazar al-Sharif. And wow. like I went to Afghanistan in 2009 to build an orphanage and a school with the profits from uh, an album that I had called The Third World with DJ Green Lantern. Shout, Shout out to my brother Green Lantern. Shout I remember that, Lantern. yeah. Thank you for helping me with that Green Lantern. He was somebody that believed in me. Um, and brought me up to the radio even when they were like, don't bring him the fuck up to Hot 97. Now, I remember now, when you now guys, they're like, oh, he's a legend. But before they're like, don't bring him up here. Well, I he's say, crazy. I remember when you guys linked up because Green Lantern had kind of been like heavily associated with like, you know, the that mixtape era, rocking with Eminem. And then like to see, shady, to see you guys come together, time. it was kind of like dope. Because obviously perception wise as a kid, you don't, I didn't associate a Green Lantern and Immortal, even though it makes sense, like mm-hmm. musically, and it was dope. But yeah, I think, it, like like you said, like you pointed out so much stuff early because, again, at that time, we didn't have access to YouTube and like jumping down a rabbit hole. And it's like, wait a minute, what is he talking about? Like, right. you know, I think, um, I think that you definitely, uh, you know, in terms of shedding the light to a whole generation of kids who were just hip-hop heads, you definitely did open their eyes to a lot of wild shit, man. And a lot of truthful shit. Right. And also, I think that even to this day, there's songs that I've written that people still ask me questions about. Like, I'm not going to lie, Kev, 
even 20 years later, people ask me, is Dance with the Devil a true story? And I have to look these people right in the eye and say, sir, I am not responsible for raping or killing any women. That is absolutely crazy. It is a song. However, yeah. I can take people if they really want to the building where this incident happened in Harlem. Mm. And the truth is that that actually did happen. And those people that were allegedly responsible for that began dying. And that's why it became such a powerful story. Because everyone's like, oh, you're telling hood tales. What if these motherfuckers come back for you? And I said, let them. Right. What are they going to do? Like, you think that the neighborhood is going to protect them after they find out what they really did, that they raped a woman? Do you realize that in rich communities, you can get away with stuff like that? You're like, oh, there are little kids coming in all hours of the night. No one says anything. Right. They're all billionaires. But if you live in a ghetto and someone says a rumor in the hood, oh, someone's touching kids in apartments. Yeah, they get, they're getting hey, yo, fucked bro, up. Yo, bro, everybody from the neighborhood. Yo, yo, yo. Get by, stop by. The what the, yeah. the fuck is going on here, homes? So that's the kind of energy it was. And these people literally started dying. And one of them, I, 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 we're not going to mention names because these people don't deserve to be remembered in a good light, but this is a sad story. They couldn't find this man, Kevin. Mm -hmm. And I, what I explain to people about the street is that there's no, there's no rules. Just like there's no such thing as a safe gun, you have to respect everything. I'm a big Second Amendment guy, but you idea. have to respect the weapon. There's no such thing as a safe gun. These people were out here thinking that they could get away with a crime and that they wouldn't be found, and they murdered this man's son mm. to get him to come to the funeral so they could kill him. Jeez. This is the type of shit that people were dealing with. That's one of your... Would you say that's your most popular song? It's like one of them, right? Probably, yeah. Yeah. Um, for people who... Because there's going to be people watching this YouTube video who subscribe, who, who maybe are not hip to your catalog. That's fine. Give us a break. Like For people who haven't heard Dance with the Devil... What is the premise of the record? Well, I mean, without giving the entire thing away, I would say that um, it's definitely a very realistic tale of what happens when people feel peer pressured to commit violence to join a gang or when they feel like they have to overcompensate for not being as tough as everybody thinks they is and they commit violence and do horrible things to people to try to prove something to somebody. I remind individuals that are really living in the street we don't deal with gratuitous violence. Mm -hmm. We deal with people that have offended or hurt us who have come into our neighborhood and caused problems. The premise of going into another neighborhood and just trying to hurt people right. doesn't make sense now. I mean, even if you ask the essays that run each block, they'll be like, why would I start a war for no reason? But in New York City, it was structured differently. It wasn't so much gangs. It was crews back in New York. Right, right, right. So if you heard about a story like this, it became an urban legend immediately. And not just that, Kev. It was that the story was always a little bit different. Instead of it being the guy's mom, it would be the person's stepsister, it would be the aunt, it would be someone related. And I think when you have tales about you know, murder or killing people, it's aggrandized some, sometimes in hip hop to the point that you never really see the impact of what that is. Like Even if y'all kill someone that's not a kid, if y'all kill someone that's 30 years old, you think that's not somebody's son? Of course. You don't think you have or a target on your back, right? You don't think that somebody's coming back or, for you. Yeah. That's the reality. And, and more often than not, when people come up to me and they say, oh, do you think the guys from Dance with the Devil were really cursed by the devil? And I'm like, no, they lived a horrible lifestyle where they thought they could get away with hurting people at random. And eventually, it that caught catches up, up, not just to them, but to their children as well. Mm. Yeah, that's some real shit. You had... Uh so many records that were controversial. Did you ever like feel any pressure from like outside entities when you were touring? Because obviously you were you were kind of like one of the few people I would say pre you. Because I kind of attribute like YouTube to helping with a lot of people's education on certain situations because it's free and it's readily available, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like when you first kind of uh, came on the scene, that wasn't necessarily the case. Did you? get any blowback from like the government or did you ever have like like a target on your back in terms of like just some of the things you were talking about especially to the youth post 9 11 you know what i mean i've had several incidents where police have come to my house uh homeland security um i didn't become a citizen until i was 17 so they brought an ice officer with them as if that was supposed to intimidate me right but an individual such as myself is lawyered up the wazoo 
Yeah, uh, I learned as that you should a long be. time yeah. ago. Like, listen, I can't fight the system by shooting back at them. That's what they want. Yeah. I mean, I'm, unless I'm I'm ready to go full Chris Dorner, right. right? Rest in peace. But if I am sitting there trying to get my point across and I don't want to be censored or I don't want people to control that aspect of the music, then sure, I have to take those precautionary measures ahead of time of whatever I do. I think being mature enough to look back as a kid and know, hey man, these are some of the mistakes I made. These mm -hmm. are things I could have done better. There are things I would have done differently now. Like honestly, I'm doing it 100% alone now. I'm even more independent than I was before. Everything is now Rebel Army Records and just straight immortal technique. And then I built a 501c3 um, that we modeled after the Black Panther Breakfast Party program to be part and linked to that label. It's called Rebel Army Runs, and you can find us. That's a on, charity, right? Yeah, five hundred one c three. Just for I, people don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's a charity. Um, you can find us on the internet at Rebel Army Runs, and basically, you remember the projects you were talking about. Mm -hmm. We've been to just about every project in Manhattan, and now we're expanding to Brooklyn, um, where we give away a two week food pack to the seniors through that. Um, mm -hmm through their community centers and yep. through the that NYCHA housing programs directly. And I just want to point out to people that didn't know that in New York City, right, during the pandemic, they canceled 14 food programs for people. They couldn't afford to feed those people. And we actually became the functional food program for the Dykeman houses, for the Grant houses, which wow. were serviced this morning by my team when I wasn't there. You can see the posts right now. Big shout out to my brother Thanos and uh, the little short, little Dominican shorty Jean that came and uh, took my place mm. because I do it myself when I'm not doing a series of other things. Wow. So it, it's been a joy to be able to do that. And we've, we're proud to say that um, all donations are, are now tax deductible because of our 501c3 status. And we've passed the mark where we fed over 10,000 families. And when I say a two week food pack, I mean we give them like four, two to three, four cases of, um, of tuna. Then we have a two week oatmeal pack. We have canned milk. Um, we have raviolis. We give them like tomato paste. We give right. them pasta. And then we like to have soups in there. And then we give away inshore for the elders. And we have also Pedialyte and Pampers. Wow. And they have uh, feminine products as well. So I always tell people, revolution isn't sexy. You know what I mean? It's not it's just not, about having a beret and yeah. running around the jungle with a gun. You got to get your hands dirty and help people. And it's not always easy. You know? Well, I think too, like, that's, I think that's important to point out because so many artists that I grew up listening to around that same era who I guess were probably perceived as conscious rappers and i i don't know if i consider you a conscious rapper as much as like a reality art but you know back in that day there was like the conscious rap thing mm. and a lot of those guys didn't put their money where their mouth was i guess mm. you know what i mean in terms of like like it's dope to see 20 years later you're just fighting the good fight man like right. fighting the fight for your people i i can't speak to other people but what i can say is this I could say that because my life was personally affected by these things, um, I wanted to contribute back. Like for example, for the people that don't know, um, I went to, I got locked up when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I spent uh, my 21st birthday being incarcerated in the hole. And when I got out, I thought one of the things that I could do is teach at a school. And what we did is myself and a young lady named Carmen Perez, um, I met the great Harry Belafonte, shout wow. out to Harry Belafonte. And he said, you know, you have such a way with words. Would you consider being a teacher in one of these school programs? So Harry Belafonte gave me my first teaching job, and I taught at a school called Horizons. So it was interesting because at the time, um, I was still kind of touring this album called The Martyr, mm -hmm. um, which did great. Like four million downloads, everything was wonderful. We toured right. the world. But after like the tours were over, I had the the really kind of painful but joyful reality of bringing this workshop, which was called Confronting Trauma Through Writing mm -hmm. to the kids. And the stories that they wrote were not just uplifting, but they were also heartbreaking. I can imagine. Sometimes you feel like you need a shower afterwards because yeah. you realize how much suffering these kids have been through. And then again, to bring it back to your other point, those kids, those hood kids, they are the real underground. 
right? right? Like you talk about the backpackers. Yeah, they had guns and knives in that backpack, and they had shit that they stole from the polo store. The underground shout out to the, the lowheads, man. The underground kids are, in are the people that make up the crews of all of the major label rappers. Right. So while y'all are praising them and acting like they're the hardest people in the world, the reason that they're in the position that they are is because they're backed by the in underground independent people that are in these neighborhoods. Right. Now, you would think that applies to just one of them. No, it applies to all of them. Right. And I feel like in, in my particular situation, um, any neighborhood or any city that I've come in, I've always approach them with such love and respect that I've gotten nothing but that in return. So whether I'm in Detroit, I got fam out there. Yeah. Whether I'm in Miami and in LA, I'm home. Yeah. Like half my family moved out here when we came from South America in 1984. And you know they married into Mexican families from Oxnard and also from Inglewood. Mm -hmm. So we've had our family be here for years. And right, now right. we get together, we have arguments about whose food is better, Peruvians or Mexicans, whose pyramids are nicer, ours. But I think that it's nice to have that kind of camaraderie. And, and I, I will say this, Kev, it's sad for me to see artists come out here and die or get hurt and robbed because yeah. I've oh, I've never felt unwelcome here, brother. I've never felt that. And maybe it's just because of the way I move and I don't call it checking in because I'm not paying people for protection. Right. But I'll come and if some of the brothers or the essays ask me, hey, man, we're doing a kids program. Like, uh, for example, Sick Jackin and uh, Hood Santa and then my homie Sleeps, the, the, the artist, mm -hmm. incredible dude. They did this... Um, they did this workshop for kids where they brought a bunch of different neighborhoods together from East Los, from other places to do art workshops. I was a pleasure to join that. And I don't charge people for appearances. I'm like, yo, man, let me just come there. Whatever I can do to offer and lend my voice to this is something that we need, you know? At some point, somebody's got to be the adult in the room, Kev. Hey, what up, y'all? Bootleg Kev, got to stop the interview to tell you about our newest sponsor, man. Shout out to the homies at Hardeen Las Vegas. That's right. The number one dispensary in the whole state of Nevada, let alone in the whole fucking country. So many choices of premium cannabis, ladies and gentlemen. It is like, how can I put this? You walk into it, you go to Hardeen in Las Vegas. When you're on vacation, when you're out there tricking off, whatever you're doing, stop off at Hardeen. Tell them I sent you. Be like, yo, bootleg Kev sent me. They're going to take care of you at Hardeen. When I say selection, I mean selection of the best premium cannabis in the world, the best dispensary. There's a reason why Hardeen is world famous. Follow them right now, Hardeen underscore Las Vegas. Go to their website, HardeenLasVegas.com. That's J-A-R-D-I-N underscore Las Vegas. When you're in Vegas, you have to pull up to Hardeen. Tell them I sent you and get high off your fucking face. I don't even know what that means. How do you get high off of your face? Eh, whatever. Melt your fucking face off with some of that good Hardeen, y'all. Go follow him one more time. That's Hardeen underscore Las Vegas. Let's get back to the interview. Yeah, I think too, man, LA is, it's a, it's a unique place because of how uh, the unemployment stimulated people's pockets during COVID probably more than anywhere else. And uh, once that went away, I think people, a lot of people who weren't used to living a certain lifestyle, right? They got a taste of that lifestyle. And, um, and, you know, they're trying to keep that. I mean, once you get a taste of having that real money, because there was people eating off PPP and the EDD out here. Um, so also, too, like, you know, I think a lot of the obviously, you know, there's people who are just wrong place, wrong time. I think another thing is, is like kind of being just self-aware of where you're at. Are you going to walk around with a hundred thousand dollars around your neck when somebody's starving. Right. I mean, you got to kind of like understand like the climate that's going on in LA right now. It's crazy because I used to feel like when I'd go to New York, I'd be like, you know, New York is the place where you get jacked. And I'm not saying it still isn't. Of course it is. But I feel like LA feels like just a much more dangerous place now. Even just going to New York, we were just like, man, it's so nice. There's not that many homeless people. Like there's homeless people, obviously. We saw a bunch. But like certain areas of LA, it's like, it's it's like Skid Row all over the. But place. there are Skid Row places in New York. I'm I'll, sure there are. I'll there take is. you there next. Yeah, time yeah I'm sure. No, I'm sure. And 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 every city has that, right? Yeah. But I was. We were all over the city. Like if you just drive around LA, which I'm sure you've seen, it doesn't matter if you're in Skid Row. There's just 
30 tents on the side of the road. There's like, right. I mean, I f- but but you guys don't have a subway system that people live in. This is true. That's what we have too. We no, have that's true. The subway there. system is a whole other variable. We have people that live underground. As a matter of fact, years ago there was a movie uh, made called The Mole Men, and it was a documentary about people. And I will tell you myself, one of the craziest experiences I've ever had is I was 17, and I used to run with a bunch of wild Dominican motherfuckers. Right. I mean, talk about cutting, slicing, get the fuck out of the way when you've seen all 30 of us coming <laughs> right, down right, the street. Right, right, right. And one day, we were uh, writing graffiti at a place called um, the Freedom Tunnels, which is on 72nd Street. It's all gentrified now. But I walked down the Freedom Tunnel, right? And when we were leaving, we saw a, a dude just coming out looking like shit, like a, like a regular homeless dude, like all fucked up. Yo, and he had a plastic bag with him, right, Kev? He goes to one of the, like the, the little fountains, he washes himself off, Kev. He takes out a hand towel and uses it like a regular towel. He puts on a button-up shirt, smacks on a name tag, puts a hat Goes on to work. and gets ready to go to work. And we approached him because I was like, yo, I want to ask this motherfucker something. So we approached him and he at first was like, all right, yeah. you've seen 20, 30 Dominicans. Yeah, yeah. He thought we was going to... We was gonna vic him. Right. And I said, yo, yo, we don't want to do nothing to you, bro. I said, I just want to ask you something. And he was like, what's up? And I said, you really live in, in, in the train tunnels? He said, yeah, there's 150 people down there now. He's like, I'm one of the people that lives there with my wife. Oh, wow. And I said, oh. They got that in Vegas, too. So there's like a whole city of people underneath Las Vegas. Right. So when I asked him this, I said, wait a minute. You live with your wife down there, yeah. and then you guys, and she's like, yeah, she has a job as a waitress, and I have a job working at this spot where I like, you know, I'm like a floor helper or right. whatever. That's fucking great. And you know what? That day, I'm sitting in the park where all my people's a small while, and yeah. I'm just smoking an L thinking, and I'm like, and they're like, what's wrong? And I'm like, you know that dude we ran into? And they were like, yeah. I said, he's doing better than me. And they were like, what the fuck are you talking about? He's homeless. I said, no, 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 no. No. I asked the guy before we left, I said, what's, what's the goal? He said, you know, we can save up some money, and then me and my wife, in like a few years, we can move out of there, and we can try and get our own place again, get back on our feet. And I looked at the guys, and I said, don't you understand, bro? Y'all motherfuckers out here looking for, for random broads. This motherfucker not only found the love of his life, but he found a woman that really holds that standard for better or, or for, for worse. worse. And not only that, yeah. but y'all motherfuckers don't got a plan. Right. This dude got, got a plan. plan. Least, yeah. And I sat there and I was like, I don't got a plan and I don't got a ride or die. Right. What the fuck am I doing? Right. I still live with my mom and dad. I'm still, I'm still, I'm still with a life preserver on. Right. This dude's swimming in the ocean with wifey trying to make it. And it humbled me so much that I I swear I have a such a, a different attitude dealing with people. I talk to a janitor the way I would talk to I think everybody should do that, man. Right. Because you never know. Like, I always tell that to people. I'm like, man, you never know who you could, especially, you know, outside of just day-to-day real life. Like, I talk to young artists all the time about just, like, treating the, in, you got to treat the interns with respect. You got to treat the engineers with respect because you never know who's going to end up being the president of, the, of your label one day or, yeah. mm. you know, whoever. So yeah, no, it's definitely the case. Even like up and coming artists, you know, a lot of times people shit like will shit on up and coming artists. Like it's like you, that could be the next whoever the fuck, and right. they might or, re- or they'll just go at the youth because they're like, I don't like this style or something like that. So I I know that being from my era, everybody when the when the skinny jeans first came out, they were ripping these kids, and I used to joke with everybody. I used to be like, listen, they might be wearing skinny jeans. They might even have a purse on. But there's a gun in that purse. You got to be careful with these little kids. Like you can't Fact. just smack them up like there's nothing. You have to respect the fact that the youth still they want to prove themselves in some way. Facts. Facts. And so you know whether people make fun of them here, like the Edgars at Knott's Berry Farm. You don't want to get jumped by oh, fifty Edgars. Oh, you're tapped into the Edgar culture you you, you, at Knott's. You, you don't want to get jumped. Well, listen, fam. Don't get jumped by fifty Edgars at Knott's Berry Farm because that so is not that's LA not culture. something that your your <laughs> reputation can recover from. All right, you getting beat up by gang members, people are like, all right, he, what what do you expect? You, but you getting jumped by children, yeah. 
Don't you, do that. Do you follow all the uh, like food communities and like all those IG pages? Food's Gone Wild? Yeah. Big shout out to Food's Gone Wild. Yeah. yeah they're they're the cool people. They're hilarious. I think that. The, but they always have the Edgars fighting at Knott's. It's right. always a thing. <laughs> it's like, fuck, what's going on at Knott's Berry Farm? They like had to change the rules. Yeah, they made it so that like, you have to have a big homie with you. Yo, but that didn't change that much it's because. Like, I could just get the 20 year old homie to come. Right, in. right. Yeah. So you have to be accompanied by an, someone over 21. Yeah. It's so great. you just got to bring the big homie now. Uh, what it was your. Because obviously, uh, I think that we just went through a pretty wild historical time with the pandemic. Mm. Um, I think that a lot of the people who question the vaccine are probably like feeling a little more vindicated of recent recent yeah. memory. But uh, from your perspective, someone who's always kind of spoken about big government and just shit, you know, I, what was your thought process now that we're kind of removed? I, I wouldn't say we're totally removed, right? But mm -hmm. Now that we've kind of gotten through this pandemic, the the vaccine, just all like it was kind of a weird era of life that I'm not sure we'll ever see again, and maybe we we will. I don't know. Well, I mean, when they came out, I posted on Twitter that um, I thought the mandates were unconstitutional. I got into lots of arguments with that. Um, I told people that they shouldn't listen to uh, media personalities and that they should concern themselves with dealing with their doctor rather than anybody else. Fair. Um, there are people that are immunocompromised that would have benefited from that. And then there are people, for example, that had a high heart rate, like my friend's mother. When she went to go get vaccinated, she went to her doctor first and they said, wait a minute, ma'am, you have very high blood pressure. This is dangerous. Let's lower your blood pressure first. Then, and that's what happened. And right. she was an RN. So she was one of these people that had to get vaccinated or lose their job. But now- Which was crazy. Right. But now in, in court, in New York court, they, they've uh, overturned- they're, they're rein, well, like, I just saw that. They're reinstating- all the well, before we before we say that, yeah. that's not actually happening yet. There's been an appeal filed by the mayor, so the okay. mayor is going to appeal it. Because I saw that they were going to try to pay yeah. them some back. Well, pay. well, no, no. Just for the people that are, are watching at yeah. home, they fought the 9/11 first responders for 20 years. You think that they're going to get their pockets tapped? By Nurses. a handful of people. No, right. the city is ruthless. Yeah. Okay, these people are monsters. These are they're animals. Like when I say that my friend Aton Edwards, who was on Fox on NBC, he was on all these companies. Um, he's a survival expert, mm -hmm. and when he went down and was helping to pull people out of the rubble on 9/11, he was in a full hazmat suit. Kev, Crazy. he told me he was like, he, and he was yelling at the police officials. He's like. Look, dude, why are you giving these firefighters and cops these fucking shit breathers? Why are you giving them like a fucking N95? That doesn't help. Right. In th there's radioactive chemicals in the air. Yeah. Like there's actual 9-11 syndrome now. People have right. this corrosive chemical in their lungs because they don't actually have a conversation about what was in those floors, those buildings. Yeah, the like the bureaucracy lab. of the politics right. of it. I mean, I think that's a, a big, uh, John Stewart's a big proponent of trying to get help to, I mean, if people maybe have seen some of the viral moments of John screaming at politicians. Like, right. But yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy if like you can't take care of the people, the biggest tragedy in the history of our country, really. you know. I mean, how about this? We went on a, a different podcast, American Cholo, and we brought up the fact that there are a lot of deported veterans. And I have a lot of my friends that don't have papers that say that they're a United States citizen, but they have papers that say they're a United States Marine and that they served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And these guys aren't being deported because they're murderers or rapists, Kev. They're being deported because they fucked up some paperwork or because they had a drug addiction. And my stance is, regardless of how you feel about immigration, how dare you tell a person who, who stood a post and, and supposedly served this country for your freedom, whether you believe that or not. Because yeah. some people say, oh, it was all oil wars. Regardless, this man stood a post. And if you can throw him him out so easily and you can throw his benefits out right if his missing hand doesn't mean anything then your missing eye don't mean nothing congressman if you don't if his missing fingers and his missing jaw don't mean nothing then your missing legs don't mean nothing senator that's the truth whether it's democrat or republican mm -hmm. you have to pay attention to the people that have bled for this nation because empires don't die because they lose a war we haven't won a war since world war ii they die because people stop believing in them that's real that's, I mean, that's crazy to say out loud. We have not won. I mean, we, we did not win the Afghanistan war. We did not win Vietnam. I mean, we yeah. tied Korea. 
Yeah, it was a, it was a wash. It was a wash. All right, you can have that. Yeah. And we'll take this. Yeah. It- Hey guys, we got to stop the interview to tell you about our good folks over at BlueChew.com. That's right. Listen, you got to go to BlueChew right now. Sign up for uh, BlueChew with the promo code bootleg. You're going to get your first month for free. BlueChew, the same active ingredient as Viagra and as Cialis, but in a chewable form. That's right. You pop the BlueChew, chew that thing, wash it down with your beverage of choice. And then get to work with that hard fucking cock of yours. Your dick is going to be harder than trigonometry was in high school, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to be fucking raw. Like, you know, uh, Ryu and Street Fighter, he'd be like, Ariuken, and he does the motherfucking, this is going to be your dick. It's going to be like Ryu's fucking uppercut. You know what I'm saying? God bless whoever's on the receiving end of that. Consensually, of course. Uh, they're going to thank you for taking the Blue Chew. So go to bluechew.com, use the promo code bootleg, all right, I'm talking free month, right to your doorstep, indiscreet packaging, no awkward doctor's visits, all right? It's all online. You don't have to worry about going and sitting in a waiting room and be like, hey, doc, I have my dick. I could use a little a pep in my step, and then it's awkward. You got to look at this old fuck talking about your dick. He might ask you to pull it out. Who fucking knows what's going on? At Blue Chew, none of that's happening. BlueChew.com, and they also got the new, brand new uh, mint-flavored chewable, which has vardenafil in it which is the same active ingredient as levitra and staxin which is a little more potent a little more potent if you need the extra on top of the extra you know what i mean get the mint chewable yeah your wife will thank you your girlfriend will thank you your boyfriend will thank you whatever the fuck you're fucking will thank you as long as it's legal all right let's get back to the interview go to bluechew.com promo code bootleg that's it that is that is wild to think man like for you do you feel like um your messaging, your music, like, do you feel like you're a voice that is needed now more than ever because there's so much muck in the world? There's so much, especially on the hip hop side, man. Like, I mean, I, I feel like we're missing a moral technique right now. I mean, thank God that I'm coming out with a new record, right? Yes. Thank God that I'm working on new music. So I, I've definitely been doing that. And also, um, I guess I'll just come out and say it since I've been saying it on other podcasts. Um, I do some screenwriting now. I do like fixing scripts and people contact me for stuff. And um, it's been an incredible experience. The only problem with that, Kev, is that when I do writing, people can edit the joke if it's too ruthless or something right. like that. I'm like, why? This is the point. This is right. why you people have me in the fucking room yeah, you're to write the type of shit that yeah. people are like, oh my God, what the hell? But that's just to a limit. I think with music, with hip hop, I'm able to do that even more so than I ever was before. And then, of course, you know, I started this journey um, with my brother Southpaw, who used to work for Puff Daddy. Mm -hmm. So he knew a lot about kind of the the studio environment. He had set up the Pro Tools for Daddy's house. Um, So I guess, for me, one of the best parts about kind of growing with this culture has been to always stay true to the ideals that it first started. We're not here to try to convince people of what it is. Mm -hmm. We're here to offer you these facts that you have not been presented before. You haven't even seen the evidence. You're basing your opinion on what you've been shown, but not everything else. I think it's hard to divorce people from their politics, Kev. It is, man. Because their politics is not just politics. It's their entire circle of friends. It's the echo chamber that right. comes with it's it. It's the family that they're with. It's you, who you follow on Instagram. It's, it's telling what the you, algorithm It's telling people you. to leave your family. Yeah, it's right? crazy. So people have gotten to a point where it doesn't matter the morality of the person that's been assigned to it. As long as it's their side, they can find a reason to not hold that person to the same standards as they would somebody else. And at that point, it's just so politicized that there's no moral left in it. It's not like there's a moral compass. There's just like, oh, okay, imagine if your lawyer, your your son goes to, to trial for murder, right? right? The best lawyer in the world has a 14-year-old wife. Fuck and you're like... Crazy. Dude, he's the best lawyer in the world, though. Right. <laughs> what are we doing here? That's where we are in politics. And, you know, we don't even have a shared history. You saw the governor of Florida get up and say, hey, it's wrong that we to, teach. To say that we, were, we, we have stolen we're, land. Yeah, yeah. Right? Literally, yeah, it's crazy. Like, I was going to ask you, man, because we're probably, it's funny because I remember as a kid how 
much people did not fuck with George W. Bush at a certain point. I remember like that Michael Moore shit came out. Uh, mm-hmm. I forget then it was a Bowling 911 or some shit. Uh, the, 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 the first documentary that kind of like was like kind of political. People weren't fucking with Bush, but then there was people who were loving Bush. But now, man, this shit is so crazily divided. And I feel like the pendulum on each side has swung so extreme mm-hmm. that like if somebody, like you said, if somebody is just a a normal common sense human being like you said like i feel like i probably i grew up like a democrat right but i feel like more and more i'm just like maybe i'm just like an independent or uh a libertarian i don't know because like you said like i'm also very pro second amendment um but nowadays man it's like everybody and it's probably always been like this but it's a little bit more magnified these days because of social media but I just feel like we're in this like weird rut as a country where like everybody is just so standing on whatever this island is and whatever this island's going for at the time, you have to align with all of it or you're on you're over there. Mm. Like I would like I would have well, the truth is it you bring up a good point. Democrats have never fought against Republicans as hard as they fought against the left wing of their own party. Facts. That's the God. That's the God's honest truth. And a lot of people that I personally know that started getting closer to Trumpism and to MAGA. And I, I listen. This is the God. Listen. If you, if your feelings get hurt, I, I'm, I'm not here to coddle you. A lot of those people were actually Bernie Sanders supporters, and that's they feel, crazy. and they feel that the Democratic Party is more corrupt. Than the well, Republican, they fucked Bernie but, over two two they, times in a but row. But they they feel like it's more corrupt. I think when we talk about the war being involved in it, that's one thing where I have to draw a line because Republicans can't hide behind Trump's skirt simply because he didn't start any new wars. He dropped a Moab on Afghanistan, and after the first eighteen months of his presidency, please look it up. The drone strikes started again. However, that doesn't excuse them pushing Democrats to a point where they had to have Mr. Obama commit a series of war crimes because the drone strikes that he was uh, uh, sending out to Afghanistan were based on metadata. That's why they gave him the name, the Drone Ranger, right? Uh, Because those metadata, the metadata literally means a phone, or a device. So you're basing it on a phone that this person drop could have. Bomb at. Right. Which is why when they exposed the rate of the drone strikes, they found out that it was over 80 and 90% the wrong person that they hit. And why did we have to learn that through WikiLeaks? That's just unfair to the people themselves who right. pay taxes into a system where they believe they were actually fighting a war against people trying to kill us. Whereas we knocked over a country that had nothing to do with 9-11. Nothing. And then when we get really into detail, remember the, the, that lady, Sarah Palin, mm-hmm. and everybody was making fun of her because she couldn't answer what the Bush doctrine was? Mm-hmm. Listen, the Bush doctrine, ladies and gentlemen, is us knocking over countries in the Middle East that don't follow our hegemonic view of the region. Tell me that Mr. Obama didn't do that once Mr. Bush got out of office. He did the same thing. That's the issue that we're facing. We're facing the nakedness of the empire, the mask taken off, the revealing of the fact that we don't actually care if a place is democratic or communist or any of these things. As long as you back the United States of America, we'll give you a pass. Mm. In the same way that I see these horrible things, the, the, the arguments that are happening online in between... Uh, uh, black people and Jewish people over what's transpired with Kanye, Kanye and everything. Yeah. And I say the sad part is that if you look at actual conservatives that have said horrible things about Jewish people, they're not their bank given, accounts didn't get touched. They're not touched, but it's also because they supported the state of Israel in the same sentence. Mm. So this complicates the case very much. And I think it's actually damaged the relationship that black and Jewish people have because they feel like they've been singled out and the other group feels like they've been singled out. I think that more than ever needs some kind of healing, some kind of reciprocity to understand because you have an entire group of people who say, well, there's different consequences for us versus that. And that makes people feel like their lives aren't worth the same. Right. Right. And I think on the other end, you have a group of people who have felt 
that they've been persecuted in Europe and now they're persecuted here and therefore high up on end. And whether you agree with anything the man said or not, you have legitimate divide in the community now where people are arguing that didn't even have a problem or were consciousness to argue argue before. So like you said, the political lines are already kind of drawn there for a person if they wanted to crawl into that trench to then feel comfortable with because they don't have to listen to an opposing opinion. Like you said, there's a lot of echo chambers. There's a lot of places where people just hear something repeated. They don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to say, okay, well, Republicans have actually never shrunk in the size of government. That Democrats have committed war crimes in the past two, two decades. These are not comfortable topics. But they're true. And that's the reason why I guess people love my music, because I give it to both sides, because I don't pull punches. And because when it comes down to it, I'm not just independent in terms of the music, but I try to be independent here in front of the politics because I realize what's actually happened as a case of this. Now, we could take subject matters independently, right? right? Like immigration, abortion. We can discuss all these things. Of course. But with that comes historical nuance, right? When people say, oh, immigrants, you got everything. And I'm like, well, why don't you look up the Homestead Act or the Dawes Act, where this government gave millions of acres to white settlers that just came off a boat from somewhere because you wanted indigenous people to be replaced. Mm. We hear a lot from the far right about uh, a white replacement theory, but let's have a conversation about indigenous replacement practice. Yeah, like the actual reality of that, yeah. So I think... In many ways, it's not that people are angry at socialism, Kev. They're mad that only rich people have been able to use it, that they got billions of dollars of bailouts, and that nobody who lost their home got any bailouts. Yeah, I always say, like, socialism, like, obviously, I think, like, I was a Bernie supporter. I donated to his campaign. I loved, I loved Bernie. I just loved him because he was the most consistent politician I had ever seen, at least. He was very honest in the sense that, you know, when you heard that... Uh, Hillary Clinton calling him a, a, a violent misogynist. Everyone was scratching their head. Like, you talk about your husband? Yeah, you she, talk she, about she, Bernie? She's wild. What are we she, doing here? Yeah, she's she's yeah. Jesus Christ. The but I think but, Hillary but, Rabbit was crazy. But I think that 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 having a conversation um, just shows you how many people were understanding that yes, we do have socialism in this country. Socialism for the rich. And I'll give you an example. The 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 first kind of economic experiment that people learn in this country is a lemonade stand for little kids. Right. What up, y'all? We got to stop the interview real quick. Tell you about our good friends at MyBookie. That's right, man. MyBookie is where you want to get this money and uh, enjoy uh, being a degenerate like myself. And it's the best time of the year to be a degenerate. Because NFL season is, uh, obviously, we are in the midst of a crazy NFL season. NBA season just started. World Series is going down. And you can get your bets in right now. Go to MyBookie and sign up for a new account using the promo code BOOTLEG. That's B-O-O-T-L-E-G. You sign up right now. They will match your first deposit. That's right. Put in a 1000 Oh, they'll give you another 1000 to gamble with. That's free money. Free money to gamble with. Let's get in on this action, man. NFL season. I'm loving this part of the year. So much good, just everything to bet on. Football, basketball, fucking UFC, uh, NFL, baseball, whatever. Now is the best time to get your gamble on. So go sign up for a new account at MyBookie. Use that promo code BOOTLEG and double your deposit. Let's get back to the interview. Let me show you why this is deceptive and part of the reason capitalism is failing you. The little kid is out there selling dollar glasses of lemonade. You haven't bought the lemons, kid. Your mommy did. Just like the government buys stuff for these big companies. You didn't buy the knife that you cut the lemons with. As a matter of fact, you probably didn't even cut the lemons. You don't own the pitcher. You don't own the house. You never paid the water bill. You didn't bring the, the table outside, right. right? And you're not going to clean everything up when it's over. So you are the exemplifying precise example of what the American corporation does, which is live off the welfare of the state to make money for itself. And meanwhile, you're fighting imaginary communism when it's just corporatism. You don't even have to imagine Illuminati. Imagine the corporate board of Kmart. They'll give you as much access to what they're talking about as Illuminati will. You're not invited into that boardroom. You're not invited into the boardroom where they say, oh, we can't sell these products because they have high fructose corn syrup. I just came back from a tour 
in Europe. They're at, they don't even sell American products there because they say that they cause cancer. And they're That's crazy. And another thing, you could buy a doctor just as easily as you can buy a politician, ladies and gentlemen, which is what the FDA does here in this country. So I'm sorry I mean, that I, I got like, just bad news for you. I feel like today. that's kind of what happened with the entire COVID shit. It was like the doctors who would say, hey, it's not for everybody, or it, 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 they got silenced or they got taken off Twitter. I know there was uh, one uh, guy who was a writer, he was just on Joe Rogan recently, who he actually sued Twitter. Um, because they took him off Twitter, they banned him. He's like a writer uh, because he pretty much spoke out against the vaccine, just saying, "Hey guys, it doesn't cure it." They deleted his tweet, they banned him, and he sued him because he's that's kind of a part of his living as a writer. And he, they had to reinstate him, and then they had to pay him money. Right. Well, I mean, his his premise was, and I, I think I know exactly what you're talking about. He said, "Listen, if I'm not an anti-vaxer." I, I I'm for polio for all these other things. Yeah, I, I got the first. I got the first round of the but, vaccine. But but, but let me it. but let me just say yeah. honestly the thing that he brought up that's incredibly important that he should never have been punished for. He said that it's technically not a vaccine because if you take it, then you shouldn't get the virus. If you can still get the virus, but for example, what they decided to rebrand and say, well, it's not that you don't get the virus, it's that you get a much, much lesser effect But that's not what virus. they said initially. Exactly. So that's kind of the back foot that they fell on. And that's kind of like what I get when I argue with people and they want to try to convert me to something and then I bashed them so hard and then they're on the back foot saying, oh, both sides are corrupt. No, that's where you should have started from, brother. That's not the position you retreat to. So when I discuss these things in terms of like the COVID response, that was a big reason why we did the rebel army runs. We defied the lockdowns, not out of gratuity, not just to be on IG like, oh, we're out here yeah. when they said we couldn't be. That's not rebellion. That's right. not revolutionariness. That's just you trying to be a troll for IG. We actually went out there and when we were moving this food and these products, the police stopped me before and they said, what are you doing? And I said, I've become the food program for the grant houses. I'm feeding these people. That's just what I'm supposed to do, isn't it? And the guy's like, you're wearing like a, 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 you're wearing a vest and you have a scanner. Right. I said, that's for my own personal amusement. And he's like, what, is, what are you doing with that today? I said, I don't feel like discussing my day, officer, but I'm going to be here and I'm going to continue to support these people in my community. Oh, by the way, you're from the 26th precinct, right? You're one of Captain Alex's boys. What if she found out that you were trying to cut off the food program out of that, that de Blasio canceled? You know, de Blasio, the one that you hate, right? Yeah. I know how to talk to people. Right. So the guy's like, man, you can either stop me from doing what I'm supposed to do, brother, or you can make sure that we get through to these people. And I'm going to be real. They folded, not in like a, a, oh, no, no, like, no, they folded like, wow, I see your point. Cool. So we were out there and through all the lockdowns, we started this program in March mm -hmm. of 2020. So when this just started, because they really announced the pandemic in like February. Mm -hmm. So late March, early April was when we started. And it was me and this one tiny little Dominican girl. Wow. Right? And her boyfriend would help now and then. But- that's what it was. So I tell people, listen, you're, you're going to get yelled at. You're going to have people disagree with you. It's okay. What the purpose is, is not to force your ideas on other people. You let them come to them naturally. You present other arguments and you give them the ability to make that decision. 100%. I think too many, too many times, like we were just talking about, people expect to be able to change someone's mind immediately. And People don't work like that. I mean, if you tell people not to do something, it's a perfect way to get them to try to do something. That's how human beings are wired. Don't, yeah, and if you tell don't people touch they, the apple. If you tell people they have the to apple. do something, You're right. then they're going to be like, well, it. wait a minute. Right. Oh, wait a minute. I have to do it. It's my body. What the yeah. fuck? As opposed to like, hey, here's, what, here's the facts. Figure it out. Right. 100%, man. But I mean, I look, my, my mom is a two-time cancer survivor, so I took it very seriously. Of right. course. Like, you I know, mean, yeah, I, my, my I, grandma I wasn't, passed away from it, you know? God rest his Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, like, she was in a nursing home, man. So it was obviously a real, it's a real thing. I just think that like, there was just so much misinformation mm -hmm. that was being fed to us on TV every day. It was the fear mongering, normal shit that has been happening on the media forever. And I feel like so many of the voices that were just kind of giving uh, other alternative points and actual facts about the vaccine were silenced. And it was just like, it just... 
like I feel like two 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 years fast forward, a lot of that is kind of like, yeah, well, maybe if you did catch COVID, you really didn't need to get the vaccine. If you're a healthy person and you got it, your antibodies are going to be sh- stronger. And you, you, you know, if you're a younger male, you don't have to worry about the risk of myocarditis and all this. But shit. if you are a young person and you happen to have anything like a breathing issue or asthma, then you're much more likely to suffer some of the worst consequences. Right. It's like, it just I, depends I, on your, that, like... That, but that's my whole point, why I told people, hey, don't listen to come up with a your, shock jock. Come up go with your own and go to your doctor virus. and get checked out and say, hey, is it okay if I do this or is this wrong? And I think what the main issue that I saw happen with so many people is that a, one people weren't empathetic towards people who thought they really needed it, and the people who were who were in need of it had no empathy towards the people that were on some like holistic medicine stuff, which is right. something that I, I'm I'm down with. But at the same time, it's like, okay, you're gonna tell me that now because this person wore a mask that they're propagating fascism, like. Okay, I had an argument with a dude, like a a friend of mine who's a prominent guy in the Mm anti-vax world, and I said, listen, brother, they didn't take your freedom this time. They already had it. When you butchered one million Iraqis, a a country that had nothing to do with 9-11, they already got your freedom when they sent you to Afghanistan. They already got your freedom, right, when they had you bomb Libya and, and open a slave market there. They already got your freedom. What they wanted now with this was something totally different. They didn't need to put a microchip in the vaccine. You already got the microchip walking around with this. It's in your pocket. That's what I was telling everybody. But what they did do is that exposed something even crazier, that Adam Smith and Karl Marx, even though they're diametrically opposed sides of communism and capitalism, were both right. There's only two classes. The middle class is a farce, right? And that's what COVID taught you because you could be, have a nice house, Kev, you have a nice car, a job, but you're worth negative $600,000. And a lot of you lost your homes during that time. And you realized, oh no, there are only two classes. There's the working class and there are the people who control the means of production. And if you're not one of these two people, then you think you're one in the middle you're not really one in the middle. You're here. See, these people know who the fuck they are. They don't pay taxes. Right. Their corporation doesn't pay taxes. If people want to look up any example of that, there's a famous woman from New York called Leona Helmsley who owned the Helmsley building. And she got in trouble because for years she paid no taxes like all major corporations. Yeah, I mean, Google doesn't pay. I mean, none of these right. people pay taxes. But she went out and said in the media, in the New York Times, only little people pay taxes. And they had to get her because this you caused yeah, yeah. such a fucking uproar in New York. They were like little people. Like, mm. you mean working class people because a capitalist system creates food and shelter as commodities. So you're forced to work a 40 hour work right. week instead of venturing to things you would possibly like. The fact that, look, if I get uh, 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 an album done. And I pay the record label back in a traditional scenario. I don't even keep the intellectual property. That's crazy. If I if I get a bank a loan for anything else and I pay the loan back, you get I own yours. the car. You, it's the car is mine. Everything. Yeah. The problem is this. Now people bring up, is the house really yours? Because if you don't pay those property taxes that equal the equivalent of the house paid they over 50 it. years, they take the house. Yeah. Do you ever stop paying for it? Also, like, uh, how many people actually finish the 30-year mortgage before they, they, they move on to the next thing? <laughs> yeah, it's, like a ever, it's like a rotation of, of fuckery for sure, man. Hey, we got to stop the interview real quick to tell you about our partners at Odd Socks, our presenting sponsor here at the Bootleg Head Podcast. Listen, Christmas time is approaching faster than you think. I mean, we're like fucking a month and a half away or some shit, whatever. Uh, get some odd socks for your folks. Go to oddsocksofficial.com, use the promo code bootleg, and you'll save 20% off at checkout. The most comfortable socks in the world. That's right. We got some Scarface socks. They got WWE. You know what I mean? They also got the Cheech and Chongs. They also got the Flaming Hots for you hot shit eating fucks out there. My favorite, just the odd socks basics. They're just so comfy. Literally the most comfortable sock in the world. I'm holding the fucking sock right now. You can save 20% off. Plus, they got boxers now, baby. All right? Go to oddsocksofficial.com. 
Promo code bootleg at checkout. Save 20% off and support our family at Odd Sox and the podcast at the same fucking time. Let's get back to the interview. Well, listen, uh, you say you, you're, you're dropping new music. Yeah, um, we got the the new website, immortaltechnique.com. I actually had to sue for it. Um, I had an anonymous squatter that was trying to charge me twenty thousand oh, wow. dollars for it. So it's my, a hell of a hustle. I know a lot um, of I, I, know, I know that there's a lot of people doing that. They just buy websites and they My lawyer said, No, no, no. We've reached out to this person and they said, No, 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 we'll put the price up. So he goes, We're gonna sue and we're gonna demand that they show up to court. And they didn't show up. I showed up with my best suit on. Yeah. I was walking there. Like, I always make the joke that I was walking like Malcolm and Spike Lee in the That's beginning. So funny. Was Malcolm, like this. Uh, I was walking right to court, like, what is it? No show. Okay, thank you. The website's mine for $175. Fuck you people that tried to rob me. But now we're, we're live at mortaltechnique.com. You can get the website, you can get tour dates, and you can contact us at the Rebel Army Runs if you want to make a tax uh, uh, deductible donation to the to charity. Organization. Yep. Are you going to the streaming services or are you doing, because you know, there's, there's a lot of people who have kind of, it's an unfair system, I feel like, in terms of like, if, if, if you have like a thousand fans, you should be able to make real money off your music as opposed to making pennies off your streams. And I know a lot of people are just going straight to consumers these days, whether it's like dropping the CD, dropping a download mm -hmm. on your website, doing the vinyl thing. Like, how are, are you going to drop it, I guess, traditionally in 2022 ways, like on Spotify, on iTunes and all that? Or are you going to do other stuff? Um, I'm still looking at that. But I mean, I think... Either way presents its own challenges. I know that when I release a record, that I have to campaign the album. Right. It's not just like throwing it against the wall. I think also the fact that I've spent so much time working on this album, The Middle Passage, that it's incredibly important. The fact that it has the subject matter of pretty much an African genocide in that sense, um, I don't have the N-word anywhere on the record. Wow. It is one of the most scholastically put forth uh, examples of my work. And also, I'm going to show you that even without using certain words, I can be even more ruthless, more brutal, more painful, more gut-wrenching, more metaphorically and simile-driven wretchedness that will make you vomit blood than I did before. And I'm still that guy. And I'm still here. I'm still down with the immigrants. I'm still down with the Second Amendment. I'm still down with educating my people about how to grow food independently. And, you know, I appreciate any platform that I'm given the ability to come and speak, brother. Yeah, you're a legend. I'm curious. Earlier you said, rest in peace, Chris Dorner. Now, his, his, I feel like his story and his manifesto, I feel like that's such an interesting uh topic that doesn't get brought up enough because i do feel like it's kind of like depending on your perspective on it i mean obviously nobody should ever condone like people dying and stuff but i mm. but I, I always was thinking in my head i was like man i wonder if anybody will ever tackle that topic from like a conceptual way through hip-hop whether it's a record whether it's telling that story maybe I can, i'll keep you in the game i can't throw it for you Kev, but we definitely did bring something up like that on the record i appreciate you saying that yeah because i feel like you would be the guy to do it i'm the guy that did it already okay it's coming out and I, I, but i mean like i said we don't do gratuitous violence we talk about what it is in terms of what that exposes right the fact that people were so scared of him that they decided to shoot other people that weren't even him the fact that they were like okay you actually have documented files, and we heard testimony from the city council and so many racist things they said. Chris Dorner allegedly had documents and recordings of high-level people in the LAPD and government saying things that were probably just as bad, if not worse. Yeah. So I think that there's a lot of sketch that's around him. There's other people in that are in my proximity that I've had a similar experience with that I'll say, okay, I went to Penn State University, right? Mm -hmm. And around the same time when the sexual molestation allegations were going on Sandusky. against Sandusky, mm -hmm. that other coaches knew there was a district attorney who was the district attorney in my case, as a matter of fact, when I went to prison, um, his name was Ray Grecar, and he was investigating the Sandusky stuff. And guess what? 
He was disappeared. They found his his. He's still gone. He was he was he was declared missing. What? Like, and he's declared dead. You can look his name up. Ray Gricar. G R I C A R. And they found his laptop missing a hard drive in a fucking lake, and or like in a river, like a little stream, like a mile away from his house. So this guy, who was investigating who could have possibly covered up the rape allegations gave whoever it was cover enough for them to blame only the people who got caught and none of the giant donors from Penn State who partook the in the circle too. Yeah, that's Hey man, crazy. I, I'm not going to stop talking about this. So if something happens to me, we all know what it is. That shit's crazy. You know what, man? I do feel like though, we are in a... a um, I mean, even if it doesn't really matter, I do think that nowadays people are a little bit more skeptical of the information they're given and they'll, they, they try to dig in a little bit under the surface a little mm. bit more than, 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 you know, I feel like that's obviously inter the internet's kind of changed a lot of just the way people think. And hopefully, like you said, hopefully people can snap out of this fucking weird right. tribal, <sighs> like extreme I'm over here or I'm over here. And if you don't agree with me on this, but you agree with me on 10 other things, but you don't agree with me on this, it's fuck you, you're over there. It's like- Well, I think the, 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 the primary basis I have to say is that I'm willing to agree with um, anybody or be able to have their disagreements as long as those disagreements don't infringe on my humanity. I'm not right. trying to take away my humanity. And I think what you also bring up is important to say for all those people that are talking about a civil war, just remember- the only winners of a civil war in the United States will be China and Russia. You'll hand them the planet. Good luck, though. That's how we're going to end the interview. That's real.